This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 351. Hi, I'm Stephen M. R. Covey, the author of the New York Times and number one Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Speed of Trust, The One Thing That Changes Everything. Shift your professional growth into high gear every time you listen to this. It's the Read to Lead podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. Hi, and welcome to the Read to Lead podcast, the podcast that's dedicated to your personal and your professional growth. I'm your host, Jeff Brown, and I believe that if you want to achieve true success in your business and in your life, then intentional and consistent reading is a must. To that end, each and every week, we're joined by a successful and, in my opinion, inspiring author to chat about their latest book and their unique insights on leadership, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, entrepreneurship, and a lot more. Today's guest will be of particular interest to you if you are in school or care about someone who is maybe a child or grandchild, as in a moment, we'll be joined by prolific author Brian Tracy as we dive into his new book, Eat That Frog, for students, 22 Ways to Stop Procrastinating and Excel in School. I'll ask Brian to share about what's new and different about this new book compared to the original Eat That Frog. We'll dive deep into what he calls the three pillars of success. I'll ask why it's important to proactively tackle stress and much, much more. Brian's book is going to offer tips, tools, and techniques for structuring time, setting goals, staying on task even when you're not interested, dealing with stress, and developing the skills to achieve far more than you ever thought possible. You might say it's the book that parents and teachers have long been wishing Brian would write. First, a bit about Brian in case you're new to his work. He is chairman and CEO of Brian Tracy International. His classic book, Eat That Frog, has sold over two and a half million copies worldwide. As a keynote speaker and seminar leader, he addresses more than 250,000 people each year and is one of America's leading authorities on the development of human potential and personal effectiveness. He's worked with executives and staff of such firms as IBM, Arthur Anderson, McDonnell Douglas, and Million Dollar Roundtable. And he's the author of over 70 books and more than 300 audio and video learning programs. Brian is here today to help you as a student or uh, the student you care about learn what it takes to be successful and excel. His latest book has a bit of a familiar ring, uh, Eat That Frog for Students, 22 Ways to Stop Procrastinating and Excel in school. I'm excited to have him back on the Read to Lead podcast. Gee, it's been over five years since he was here before. Uh, well worth the wait. Brian, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Thank you very much. And as I was telling you just before we started, I love this subject. I love it so much. I'll tell you, when I was a little boy, I taught myself to read when I was four or five years old. And the way I taught myself was I read comic books. The way I read comic books is I would go down the street to the drugstore, which had a a comic book section, and I would sit there and read comic books in the drugstore. And then later what I did is I would go and I would steal 10 (laughs) comic books. It was a real art, by the way. And I stole 10 comic books and I took them home and I read them all from cover to cover. And then I went back and I replaced them and stole 10 more. <laughs> and I did this. And then, and then finally, the, 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 the owner came up to me and he said, look, he said, I know what you're doing. He said, I am watching you. And he said, and I appreciate that you return the books that you steal. So from now on, you don't have to steal them. Mm-hmm. Just take them and bring them back and leave them in good shape. And so he was in sort of a conspiracy with me, and I lived about half a block away. And so I read com- I read every single comic book from cover to cover, and that my vocabulary grew, and then I began to read more complex books. And then by the time I was 10, I was reading adult books. Mm. And a little bit older, I was reading very complex, even, even economic books. So uh, that's how much I love reading. I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> I'm so excited uh, to hear that. And, you know, most folks, when it comes to reading, are going to be familiar with uh, your best-selling book, Eat That Frog, the original version. Uh, but I'm curious to know, Brian, what was it that prompted you to, to rethink that book in terms of uh, high school and, and college students? 
Let me tell you where the book came from, and then I'll answer your question. I read a story about Mark Twain. Mark Twain was incredibly popular in his age. He was the most popular speaker and writer in the world. I mean, he filled huge auditoriums. He had a way of speaking that was amusing and mm. interesting, and people just flocked to see him. Anyway, he told the story. He said that if the first thing you do in the morning is you eat a live frog, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that's probably the worst thing that's going to happen to you all day long. And he said, that's the first line. Then there's two corollaries. And corollary number one is that if you have to eat a frog, it doesn't pay to sit and look at it for too long. <laughs> Just get it over with. He said, and the second one was that if you have to eat two frogs, eat the ugliest one first. <laughs> and then the point that he was making is that your frog is your biggest task, your most important task. It's the ugliest one, it's the, but it's the one that can have the greatest difference in your life. Mm. You, you can do little tasks. For example, if you make a list of 10 tasks that you have to do today, based on the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle from mm. 1895, two of those tasks will be worth more than all the other eight put together. However, those two are difficult. They're ugly. The rule is that you do the worst first. Mm. And what we naturally have a tendency to do is to put off the biggest task. But you could do all the other eight tasks and it would make no difference at all if you were talking to students to their grades. Mm. But if you do your number one and number two, it can make an extraordinary difference. Mm. As, of, as of this summer, we've sold 2,500,000 copies in 51 languages. Wow. And so we began talking with the publisher about we should take we should take this and make it available for students. Mm. But we didn't want to just take it and retitle it with the same chapters. And so what we decided to do is we would rewrite it completely. And I say we because I have a co-writer who was is priceless named Anna Langberger. And she's in her 20s and she has just been through what students go through. She just... Mm completed her degrees and everything else. So I said, let's, let's rewrite it. Let's take your experience and make it so it's completely different from the first book. And she came up with actually 22 chapters because when I first wrote the book, the uh, internet had just begun. And now everybody is into technology. Mm. I mean, people can't live without technology. So we had to rewrite three of the chapters so that they showed you how to use technology to get more of your classwork done. The students don't understand or realize that at the beginning of their career, when they're getting their grades, it's setting the stage for their whole life. And then when they get into uh, their jobs, they find that they have to do assignments as well, putting together proposals, mm -hmm. putting together all kinds of propositions and all kinds of things for their clients. Well, with these skills, they learn how to do that. If anybody ever says to you, oh, it doesn't matter, or it won't matter, or nobody will know, and if, if you hear that, just walk away, because this is loser talk. Mm. You know, mm. we sometimes talk about winner talk and loser talk. This is loser talk. Winners realize that everything that you do counts, and everything that you don't do counts as well. And there's a lot of people who are very smart, but they are dumb when it comes to organizing themselves. So that's what we're doing here, Jeff, is we've taken all the best ideas and put them into a simple system. And, and, and it's sort of like I say, can you uh, drive a car? Can you ride a bicycle? Can you type with a, with a keyboard? Well, if the answer is yes, then you can learn how to almost semi-automatically organize your time so that you're highly productive. And it has enormous consequences in your life. Well, in part one of the book, um, you discuss the pillars of success, self-esteem, personal responsibility, uh, goals is the third one. Uh, could you unpack each of those briefly? People are always asking me, what is the secret to success? And I say there's no secret. It's just practical things. It's like, mm. what's the secret to dieting? Well, just eat good foods and eat fewer of them. <laughs> and go on pretty now. simple. Yeah. yeah pretty simple. <laughs> I say that in life, you, you, you go through life and you'll have turning points. And turning points are always where you sort of you hit a new piece of information and it sets you off in a different direction and you're never the same again. 
Well, one of the turning points for me was that I, when I discovered the role of self-esteem in human success. Mm. And self-esteem is defined as how much you like yourself, how much you respect yourself, how much you value yourself and consider yourself to be an important person. And every single person has a level of self-esteem and your level of success is equal to your level of self-esteem. Mm. How much do you like yourself? In life, everything you do or fail to do affects your self-esteem in some way. It raises your self-esteem, which makes you feel more confident and positive mm. and more capable of doing anything, or it lowers your self-esteem. Whatever you say to yourself about yourself, that's why we teach never say anything to yourself about yourself that you don't want to be true. Mm. For example, mm. don't say, oh, I'm always late. I'm always late. Or I can never remember where I put my keys. Or don't ever say anything negative because your subconscious mind accepts it as a command. Mm. And then your subconscious mind makes it come true. <laughs> so every time that you start and complete a task, your self-esteem goes up because it's a question I'll ask an audience. I say, what, if a person runs in a race and comes in first, what do you call that person? Winner. <laughs> the winner, of course. The way that you feel like a winner is start and complete a task. Basically, you, you win. You don't have uh, live competition, but you're competing against yourself. You're competing against uh, laziness. You're competing mm. against distractions and so on. So every time you start and complete a task, your self-esteem goes up and your brain releases endorphins. Mm. And endorphins are called nature's happy drug. When you have a, an endorphin release, it gives you energy and imagination and creativity, and you want to do it again because it feels good. And so you soon get into the habit of starting and completing tasks. Mm -hmm. Now, when I talked before about the Pareto principle, that the top, the 20% of things you do account for 80% of your results. If you start and complete a little task of little importance, it gives you a little bit of mm -hmm. self-esteem, a little bit of endorphins. But if you start and complete an important task, it gives you a rush. I mean, wow, you feel great. <laughs> you feel happy. I mean, it's almost like you're, you're, everybody's in the room is applauding you. But you're just applauding yourself. And so, therefore, when you set priorities, as we talked about, set priorities and start and complete your most important task, the frog. Why? It's because that's what's going to make you feel terrific about yourself. And soon... I say, if you do something over and over again, what do you soon develop? A habit. A habit. <laughs> and, and, and Aristotle said that all of life is habits and that successful people develop good habits and make them their masters. So therefore, one of your most important jobs, developing habits is hard and mm. often hard for a long time. But once you have developed the habit, it becomes easy and automatic. Mm. And so the most successful people just develop the habit of doing the things that lead to success, happiness, and high self-esteem. You know, you're always attracted to people at the same level of self-esteem that you have. If you like yourself a lot, you'd be attracted to another person who has high self-esteem. And so high self-esteem parents will have high self-esteem children. And mm. myself and self, high self-esteem children will have high self-esteem children themselves. I have four growing children, three of whom have children. And those kids, they've raised them with high self-esteem. How can you tell if uh, kids have high self-esteem is they laugh all the time. They just laugh all the time <laughs> because they, they just feel so good about themselves. Mm. So self-esteem is, is everything. And everything you do raises or lowers your self-esteem. And every time you start and complete an important task, it makes you feel happy. It makes you feel good about yourself and it motivates you to do it again and again. And you say that second pillar, Brian, is the most direct path to a life of fulfillment. Talk a bit about personal responsibility as it relates to this. Yes. Well, what, what, what I found, the greatest enemy of success and happiness is negative emotions. I spent 4,000 hours studying the subject of negative emotions. And I went all the way back into the metaphysics in oh, the 1900s and the work that had been done in this area in the evolution of human psychology. So where do negative emotions come from? Well, negative emotions come from blaming someone or something else for your situation. It comes from a failure to accept responsibility that as an adult, you are where you are and what you are because of yourself. The minute that you stop blaming 
someone or something else for your mm-hmm. situation, then the only thing that's left for you to do is to take responsibility and to fix it yourself. And so if you, ex- if you, if you stop blaming, so what you do, by, the way you would stop blaming is you say the magic words, I am responsible. I am responsible. Whenever you have a negative experience, you immediately cancel the negativity associated with it and say, wait a minute, I'm responsible. I am responsible. So then you find that the most successful people in the world are people who accept high levels of responsibility. And as a result, they are given jobs with high levels of responsibility. And where does all the money go? It goes to those people. You know, there's only 3% of adults that accept complete responsibility for their lives. And these Mm -hmm. are the people who earn more than anybody else. When you accept complete responsibility, you're happy most of the time. Mm -hmm. You're just happy most of the time. And people say, well, you know, what about somebody runs into your car in the parking lot uh, at the supermarket and then drives away? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one thing that you control is how you respond to a situation. And Mm -hmm. when you accept responsibility, as I began teaching in my seminars, your uh, negative feelings disappear. Mm -hmm. The instant that you say, wait a minute, I'm responsible. How do you deal with a crisis? I say, well, the first three steps are very simple. Number one, stay calm. And you'll find that that's what leaders do. Mm -hmm. And I worked with top executives of of multi-billion dollar companies. And I watched them when they were dealing with problems and crises. And I watched the first thing they did is they just went calm. Because when you're calm, your mind is clear. When your mind is clear, you can think well, and you can make better decisions, and you can understand things better. The first job of leaders is to keep everybody calm. Then number two is get the facts. Very often, we get upset in a situation because we don't have the facts. So get the facts. And how do you get facts? You ask questions. And it's impossible to ask questions and be angry or upset, or Mm. irresponsible. When you ask questions, you take complete control of your own emotions, Mm. and you take complete control of the situation that you're in with other people. And step number three is accept responsibility. I appreciate you sharing, Brian, about the second pillar of success, personal responsibility in the context of a crisis, especially in the times we're in here at the end of, of 2020. Stay calm, ask questions, and accept responsibility. Now let's move to the third pillar of success, goals. If you take a sheet of paper and just take and write down 10 goals, just write down 10 goals in the present tense. So you you, you say, don't you don't say I will earn because your subconscious mind can only deal with the present tense. So you say, Mm -hmm. I earn this amount of money by this date. I weigh this amount of pounds by this date. I have a new car like this by this date. I, mm. whatever, you're, whatever they are, always say, start with the word I, and then you have an action verb. I plus action verb plus deadline. Mm. And just write down 10 things that you'd like to achieve. And I have done this with people all over the world. And one of the most wonderful things I ever hear is people come up to me, and this could be in Bangkok, or it could be in Tel Aviv, or Nairobi, or Mm. anywhere in the world. They come up to me and they say, I was at your seminar two years ago, and uh, I did what you said, and you changed my life. You made Mm. me rich. And I said, well, what was it that had such an effect on you? And they always beam. They say, it was the goals. It was Mm. the goals. I never knew about goals until you taught me about (laughs) goals. It was the goals. So therefore, I would just suggest to our friends who are listening, take a sheet of paper and write down 10 goals in the present tense. And then go over the sheet of paper and ask this question. If I could only achieve one goal on this list, which one goal would have the greatest positive impact on my life? Imagine you could achieve one goal within 24 hours. You had a magic wand, and in 24 hours, you could go to sleep at night, And the next day, the goal would be achieved. Which one goal would have the greatest effect? And you put a circle around this. Napoleon Hill called this your major definite purpose. Your Mm. MDP, your major definite purpose. He said, your life only becomes great when you decide upon your major definite purpose. Mm. So you can have many goals, but you have to have one big goal. Mm. I want to finish here on the topic of of stress. That's certainly something we all can identify with and and 
college and high school students are no exception to that. Uh, you're a proponent of proactively tackling stress and what causes it. What, what does that process look like, Brian? Where, where does stress come from? Well, stress comes sometimes from a feeling of disempowerment. There's nothing I can do about a negative situation that happens and so on. So how do you deal with stress? Well, very simple. Your mind is brilliant. You mm. can think the most incredible things, but you can only think one thing at a time. <laughs> and so the fact is, if you, if you are thinking about the event or situation that's causing you the stress, well, then you're going to be negative, you're going to be angry, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be fearful and afraid and so on. So what you do instead is get busy doing something that moves you forward towards your goal. And when you're busy working towards your goal, your mind can only focus on that one thing. And so it cannot think about the things that are causing you stress, and the stress disappears. If you're not thinking about the stressful circumstances, then they disappear. And that's why you could have a really difficult situation, and then you have a minor emergency. You, uh, somebody hits your car, you have a flat tire or something like that, and you get really busy fixing, fixing or changing and everything, and mm. you forget to have stress. And if you're a student, it's really simple. Just get so busy completing your current assignment that you don't have time to think about anything else. Mm -hmm. And while you're working on that assignment, you'll have no stress at all. Mm -hmm. And if you and when you complete the assignment, you're going to get a, an endorphin rush. And you're going to feel happy. And you're going to feel in control of yourself and your life. And then what you do, because you have lots of assignments, first of all, complete your most important assignment. Then... You do what is now your most important assignment, and you work on that. And your, your stress will disappear because your mind cannot think two thoughts at a time. Mm -hmm. If you are focusing on doing something that's important to you, you don't have time to experience stress. Mm -hmm. I know you've got about 6,000 or so books on your shelves. Uh, any chance I could talk you into uh, mentioning a couple that have had a tremendous impact on you over the years, or is that asking too much? <laughs> well, it's, it's a great question. And normally I don't answer the question because mm. people think, well, if you, if you suggest one book, that means everything that you ever need to know for the rest of your life for success <laughs> is in that single book. But yeah. I'm going to give you a, an answer to the question. And remember, the way that you think determines everything that happens to you. So the first book that affected me, and it's almost like the first book you, you read if you want to be successful, was written in 1936 by a man named Napoleon Hill. He was a reporter for a New York newspaper, and he wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich. Mm. And the story behind it is a fabulous story. But basically what he did is he was, it was given the open doors to 500 of the richest men in America, people who started with nothing and become the great wealthy people of America. Mm -hmm. And so for 22 years, he went around and he interviewed them, usually multiple times, and he asked them, why do you feel that you are successful? And then he asked other people, why do you think he or she is successful? And he came up with 17 principles. And he wrote a book called The Philosophy of Success, and it had basically 17 books. And uh, <laughs> of course, it came out just when the Depression started, and it failed completely because mm. nobody's going to read 17 books on success. <laughs> so they said, well, if you could reduce it to one book, then uh, we could probably sell it. So he wrote a book called The Philosophy of Success, 1,000 pages. I have it here. I've read it twice. So it came out. Now, the Depression had hit America, 1932-33. Who's going to read a thousand page book <laughs> on the philosophy of success when, when there's bread lines in the streets and people mm. don't have food to eat? And so they came back and they said, could you reduce it to just a normal sized book? Mm. And he said, but, 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 but this is 22 years of, of research. They said, well, you don't have to do it. So he sat down and he wrote it into a single book to about 300 pages. And he came up with the title. And the title was called Use Your Noodle to Make a Boodle. <laughs> and the, the, and the, that was the language that they used in the 30s in yeah. the U.S. And um, the night before it was to go to press, he woke up out of a sound sleep with the title, Think 
and Grow Rich. And he mm. called the publisher and they changed the title and they released the book and it's become the best selling book on success in history. Mm. And everybody who's going to be successful must start off by reading that book. That's a great one. Well, uh, this has been great. Appreciate your time very, very much. Uh, Brian's latest book, again, is called Eat That Frog for Students, 22 Ways to Stop Procrastinating and Excel in School. Brian, thank you uh, for coming back on the show uh, all these years later. Appreciated having you and, and sharing all your insights. It's been just a wonderful time. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to be with you. Before I forget, I should mention that Eat That Frog for Students from Brian Tracy was co-written with Anna Leinberger. Thank you, Anna, for your contributions to this book as well. If you'd like to dive into our conversation more deeply or to check into any of the links and resources we discussed or even connect with Brian on social media, you can find all that and more on the show notes page for this episode that can be found at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 351 for episode 351. Though I don't know I'll ever be able to sell two and a half million copies of a book like Brian did, I would love to get a copy of my upcoming book in your hands soon. It is available for pre-order right now. It officially comes out in August. You can go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash book to find out more about the book, Read to Lead, The Simple Habit That Expands Your Influence and Boosts Your Career. Again, that's readtoleadpodcast.com slash book. I'm sure like me, you're happy to put 2020 behind you. Here's hoping that 2021 can also be a memorable year, but for all the right reasons. Well, that does it for this week and this year. I look forward to seeing you next time for the first episode of 2021, when I'll be chatting with my friend and fellow Baker Books author, Jonathan Milligan, as we discuss his book, Your Message Matters, how to rise above the noise and get paid for what you know. Again, that's next time on the Read to Lead podcast. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.